I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word as we turn again this morning in Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew chapter 6, taking five, excuse me, six verses, 19 through, I can't count, can I? One, two, three, four, five, taking five verses. I was an art major, not a math major. <laughs> Verses 19 through 24. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Then the light that is in you is darkness. How great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve. God and wealth. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Amen. Let us pray. Great and mighty God, we do ask your blessing upon the reading and preaching of your word this morning. That we would hear it both read and preached with faith. Even I myself, as I'm the reader and the preacher, that I would still be instructed by your word, convicted, guided, shaped. We would live before you. As Christian men and women, boys and girls ought. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We do continue this morning in our consideration not only of Matthew's gospel, but of this most famous sermon of the world, the Sermon on the Mount, a sermon in which our Lord is simultaneously describing and instructing his kingdom. That is, he's telling us what his people look like, if you're looking for them, and what they should be about if you're one of them. <clears throat> so he, he opened uh, with the Beatitudes, telling us about the character of his people, and he then began to explore the law and the relations between individuals, that we ought to be governed not by a surface or shallow reading of the law, but all the way down. Not just murder, but hate. Not just adultery, but lust. All the way down. But we ought to be governed not simply by negative prohibitions, but the positive charge of love. And then he began to speak to us about true religion. There's a lot of religion in the world, but he begins to speak to us about true religion in chapter 6, which is marked by a sanctified secrecy. That True religion is not only, certainly not exclusively, uh, that which is done publicly, which is seen by others, some part of the religious life, what we're doing now would be a fine example, is inevitably public. But it should be the expression of what also goes on in private, in secret. So as far as we are able, much of our activity that is born of religious faith ought to be done with an audience of only God himself. Well, at verse 19, he continues, and he begins to speak to us about what governs and guides us. And it does so by the, the method of three pairs. Three pairs. He speaks of two kinds of treasure, and two kinds of eyes, and two masters. These three pairs speak to us about what governs and what guides us. We'll take them in turn. You can think of the two treasures as in what do I trust and the two eyes as in two, by what do I judge and the two masters as in whom do I serve, whom do I serve. We'll take them seriatim as they say, one at a time in order. Two treasures speaks of the earthly treasure and the heavenly. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, which are subject to moth, rust, and thieves. That's the easiest thing to understand, isn't it? We know exactly what 
exactly what he's talking about. Uh, in his day, that is the day that this was written, it was really a quite liberal matter to store up your treasures on earth. You, your wealth was in your possession, and you needed to be about uh, making sure that it was secure, whether it was metals or jewels or treasures or tools or fine cloth or whatever it was, uh, those things, spices, whatever was valuable in that day, it, you, you would have them, you would collect them, you would store them, you might put them in a hole in the ground. If you remember Aachen after Jericho, who stole what he should not have had, a, a fine piece of cloth from Babylonia and some gold and some silver, and then he dug a hole underneath his tent and he hid it in the ground, some of that hiding it from others, but that's how, that's how you would secure it. So the most secure place in your tent, I suppose. Or you can think of the rich man in our Lord's parable in Luke 11 who has so much stuff. He has crops, more crops than he knows what to do with, and so he has a genius idea. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger barns. That kind of speaks to me. I'm in the process of building a shed in my backyard. I'm building a bigger shed. I'm, I'm, Instructed by the parable, uh, at least cautioned by it. They literally store. Now, we, maybe, I don't know, maybe some of you are stuffing cash in your mattress at home. I, I don't know. I think that's now almost entirely up to cartoons to stuff cash in your mattress. Maybe you are, but what, where do we store? We stuff it somewhere else. We stuff it in banks or safety deposit box, or if we're, we're very sophisticated, we use financial instruments. You know, financial instruments to store up our treasure on earth and we we hire uh, professionals who hopefully are going to make that treasure get bigger and not smaller um, and they hope you know to meet with us occasionally say look your treasure is fatter and they don't want to meet with us and say oh your treasure got small but it's the same thing whether it's a hole in the ground or your 401k we we put our treasure there and then what do we do over it. We fret over it. We worry about it. We we check the website of the stock market. What how do they do? Is it green? Is it red? Green, red, green. Oh, it's red. Maybe it'll be green tomorrow. <laughs> Not much different than Aachen with this little hoard under his tent. It doesn't have to be much to get us all bound up about it. It is used car buying season at the Blair home, which means I have found the half dozen websites that I look at. Car gurus, autotrader.com, you know. And I have put in all the important variables, the make, the model, the mileage, the price, the distance from my home. And I have made all the micro adjustments, oh, the color, the features. How many miles? How old is that car? Then, boom, compare, me compare, me compare. Okay. Go to bed. Oh, tomorrow, compare them. Oh, is there another one? Compare them. What can I get from my rust bucket in the drive? Fret and fret and fret. And perhaps maybe even tomorrow we will go out and make the fateful purchase. And then for six months we'll pretend to maintain it in pristine shape. We'll fuss a little bit. You know, maybe, maybe six months. But we do have my wife's large dog, so it will be an uphill battle. And then it will begin its slow decline until it too is the rust bucket in the driveway. And I'll start the process, if I'm still kicking, I'll start the process all over again in another 18. Getting all worked up until it's given over to the rust and the moths. Hopefully, not the thieves. But maybe, maybe. It's the same thing, isn't it? The same process. Jesus says there is a better way. Store up for yourself your treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, the thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's a, a far more difficult thing to get our mind around, isn't it? How exactly do I store up treasure in heaven? 
I know how to build a shed. I know how to buy a car. I know how to put money in a bank. But how or what is this treasure in heaven? Well, it is, I think, noteworthy that these verses follow immediately on the previous 18, in which three times in those 18 verses, on the topic of true religion done in secret, when you give to the poor secretly, or you pray at home alone secretly, or you fast without anyone knowing it secretly, each time those things are described, Jesus followed up with, your father who sees in secret will reward you. He will reward you. In fact, that's the last thing that is said right before our section there in verse 18. Your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. I think those things are likely related. The storing up of treasures and the rewards of the father who is in heaven. I think they're related. What are these rewards that we're given? What are these rewards from our Father in heaven? What are these treasures? Well, you're not buying salvation. You're not, you're not, you know, greasing the palm of the doorman of heaven so you can get in. You're not putting a down payment on a double wide on the outskirts of glory or something like that. As we have explored previously, these are not those kinds of rewards. These are the rewards inside of a relationship of love, like the rewards a parent gives to a child or a husband or a wife give to each other. Not rewards to get into the relationship, but rewards because you're in it and you love each other. They're what we might call relational rewards that our Father promises. So what are... Or what would that mean? Relational rewards with our Father. Treasures stored up in heaven. Well, I will tell you, I can't say exactly. Because I haven't gotten there yet. I can't say exactly. But I, I'll give you two speculations. And you can take them for what they're worth. One is abstract and one is more concrete. The abstract is this. Relationships live or die by the investment in them, not, not the financial investment, the investment of self in the relationship, whether it's a friendship or something more profound, it lives or it dies by the investment that is made in it. Anyone who has had the sorrow of talking to those who are divorced, very often, not always, but very often you will hear phrases like, well, we just quit talking, or he quit listening, or she quit caring, or some such thing. We quit spending time together. There was a sense of atrophy, a lack of investment in the relationship, and the relationship died. You can think of that saddest of all pop songs, and to me it's the saddest of all pop songs. Uh, the, the old uh, Chapin song, Cats in the Cradle, tells that story of the, the little boy that is born who, who idolizes his father, but his father just doesn't have time. His father's busy with his career and the like, and the, fa and the son is fine with that, and he's willing, but he still he just thinks the world of his dad until uh, over time the son has grown, and the father now has time, and he wants to have that relationship with his son, but guess what? The son doesn't have time for him now. That relationship has atrophied. It has thinned out to essentially nothing. Well, we have a relationship with God. He is our Father in heaven. And when we are acting in the path of true religion as exemplified, but certainly not exclusively to those works of piety described in the first 18 verses, whether it's 
giving or praying or fasting or worshiping or serving or showing hospitality or any of a thousand ways that we are acting out of faith because we believe in God. We believe that he's real, that he's true, and that we have a relation with him. We believe in the gospel. We believe in our Savior. That's why the secrecy is such a distinguishing mark. There is no other reason to be about those things unless you think he's real. Not to be about those things in secret unless you think he's real. Well, when we are doing those things, he says he rewards. That is, as we are investing in the relationship, the relationship is getting better. What, what is the reward of a relationship? The reward of a relationship is the relationship itself, is it not? Isn't that the thing? I mean, th you just think of the simple, simple analogies of our human relationships. If you've ever had a, a thoroughly enjoyable family reunion or family gathering, what is the thing that is feeding the joy? What, it's, it, why I don't want to go to your family gathering. <laughs> I mean, I would. It'd be pleasant enough. But it wouldn't be the same. Why? Because my family, we have that shared history. We have the years of our relationship. Or think of a, a, a successful marriage. What, what keeps it alive? What makes it so delightful? A successful marriage. It's not that she's young and hot still, and he's ripped when they're 65, you know. It's not that. It's not that passion. You may still find each other attractive, don't you? But, you know, it's not quite as electric as when you're 21. What is it? 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. It's that life. It's that shared life. Even that life that had many, many difficult parts, but they were difficult passages that you navigated together, that you got through together. And now, even without a great deal of language, there is a, there is a bond and a reward in being together. Well, as we're navigating the Christian life, we're living the Christian life, and we're acting from faith. We are investing and investing and investing in our bond with God himself. And the reward of that awaits us. What a gathering. What a reunion. What, what a looking back on our life together. What a treasure that we're storing up in heaven abstract. Here's something concrete. It, it, it occurs to me. If you're giving to the poor or if you're praying for someone else, is not part of the treasure you're storing up your enjoyment of that person in glory. I mean, you, 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 will, you will be with them. They will be with you. You have been the objects of prayer. You've been the objects of help. You've been the objects of encouragement. You've been the objects of teaching and preaching. And you may have exercised those things toward others to their benefit as you have been benefited. And will not part of the reward of heaven be those people? And think about how that unfolds over time. So, I mean, you can think of the obvious, the great ones, you know, the great, the great Christian, you know, what, the apostles. Or the, the great evangelists, whose, whose names are known by thousands and thousands. Or the great missionaries, or, or the great authors whose books stay in print long after they're dead. Surely part of their reward and glory will be those who come to them, who share with them how their words, their ministry, their efforts affected them. And won't that be a part of their life, their reward? And their, will not the Apostle Paul... Will not a great an evangelist? Will, will not C.S. Lewis? I can just pick one. Will he not have many who say, you know, in the dark hour, your your work really helped. But don't, you don't have to be great. Do you? Imagine a simple Christian couple, simple Christian couple of no name, no fame, no standing in the world, 
So imagine they lived 200 years ago, or they lived a thousand years ago. And they, they lived their simple, faithful Christian life. They reared their simple Christian children. And then they die and they go to heaven. And then their Christian grandchildren arrive, who they may or may not have known, or their Christian great-great-grandchildren arrive, who they surely did not know, but who were affected by the faith that was passed down through them. Or maybe some great one does arrive, some great author, some great missionary, some great evangelist who was their descendant, or not even their descendant, who was affected, who was brought into the faith by their child or their grandchild. Or their, why, why would we not expect the great web of faith to be an absolute delight? I know who, I mean, I can tell you, particular individuals that were meaningful in my coming to faith. As a preacher, I speak of myself as a as a grandchild of John MacArthur. I've never seen John MacArthur. I've heard him on the radio. But I, as a preacher, I am a, a child of a minister in Savannah, Georgia, Terry Johnson. That's where I came to faith under his preaching, and it's where I was introduced to the kind of preaching that I still try to, to, to prosecute, verse by verse, the books of the Bible. But he came to those things by going to John MacArthur's church. I don't know who brought John MacArthur to faith or taught him to examine the scriptures the way he did. And I'm, we're not responsible for any failings or shortcomings we may see in their ministry. But who, who brought him to faith? And who brought them to faith? What a web. What a sowing of the seeds. And what harvest we will enjoy. Don't you want to invest in that? I mean, I hope we get a fairly new model, shiny, low mileage, new car, new used car tomorrow. Boy, I hope we get one. I hope we get a deal. And then it'll be in a scrap heap. Probably in my lifetime, it will be a hunk of junk. But as we invest in the kingdom, as we invest in our relationship in the Lord Jesus Christ, the things that are being stored up will never perish. And part of what I look forward to in glory are not the things I know I'm going to see. I mean, I'm going to get, I'm going to queue up to meet the apostles. Of course I am in time, as I imagine heaven. If I can take my eyes off the Lord Jesus, which I may not be able to do. But I presume in the course of eternity with all the faithful that we're going to mingle quite a bit. And I cannot imagine the connections that we make. You, you, to that one, to this one, to this one, to that one. What a glory. What a glory. Don't you want to invest as much as possible? As much as possible. I mean, you might miss out on a late model hunt, but eternity and glory. Where is your heart? Where is your heart? Where your treasure is? There your heart will be also. You know where your treasure is. You know where your heart is. You know where your heart is. You know what you truly treasure and what you truly trust in. Secondly, eyes. He speaks of a good eye, bad eye. He speaks of that which uh, is clear, that which is bad. He says the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in, your, in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, that is terrible anatomy. <laughs> Don't put this, if you're taking a physiology test, this is not a good description of how eyeballs work. But it is profound anthropology. Jesus isn't teaching a course in biology. He's teaching us about what it means to be 
human beings made in the image of God and navigating this world, he speaks of our eyes as lamps. We all know how a lamp works, right? We all get it. It's illumination. You need light. You're sitting in your living room. You're trying to read a book. Maybe you're doing some sewing or tying a fly. I don't know what you're doing. You're doing something, and you need more light. And so you reach over and you turn on the lamp. Now you can see. It's a marvelous thing. It was marvelous. It used to be marvelous until the great crisis, the great lamp crisis that began about 10 or 12 years ago. So I don't know what's going on. Something happened in my house. The lamps were just not working nearly as well as they used to. And over the years, the lamps have gotten worse and worse. I now need two lamps, maybe three. There's something wrong with the lamps in my house. Are they putting out bad light? It's not the quality of light that I knew when I was 20 or 30 or even 40. That light was really good light. You could read eight point type in a, a, a barely, you know, just one lamp on the other side of the room. Maybe, maybe I have mislocated the problem. Not the lamps in the room, but the lamps in my head. The gatherers of light in my head began to fail. We know something about this. Christ's point isn't about lamps or about light. It is about our sight, and it's not about our physical sight. It's about our spiritual sight. How do we see? How do we see? What if you can't trust your eyes? You can't trust. You know what happens if you can't trust your physical eyes? You step into traffic. You shouldn't use a table saw. What if you can't trust your gut, your judgment? What happens? There's a fascinating, horrible thing that happens to pilots. When they can't see the ground, they say they're in clouds or they're flying at night and they haven't learned how to do that properly. They can feel that the aircraft is moving. And so they know we're moving. Uh, and, and, and what they don't understand and what they can be disoriented about without any visual references is they think they're flying in a straight line when actually they're turning. They don't know that they're turning. Then they, they recognize that they're descending. Now they think they're flying in a straight line and they're descending. So what do you do? If your plane is descending and you're flying in a straight line, well, you just pull back on the stick and then it goes, it goes back up. But if you're turning and you just pull back on the stick, then you actually accelerate that turn and it causes you to lose more altitude. You say, oh no, I'm losing more altitude. I better pull back on that stick some more. And so now you're accelerating it more and you're making that turn sharper and you're going faster and now you're descending quite a bit. You say, well, I better pull back on that stick some more because you still think you're flying in a straight line. It's got a lovely name. It's called the death spiral or the graveyard spiral because you know where it is. So many, many young pilots who don't know about that haven't been trained about that, haven't learned to trust their instruments over what they think, what they think they're feeling, they will just spiral right into the ground. What if you can't trust yourself? But you do. But you do anyway. What if your eye is bad? Your whole body is full of darkness. Then the light that is in you is darkness. That which you think is light is darkness. I would posit that our culture is in a bit of a graveyard spiral. They don't know light from dark. They don't know right from wrong. They don't know good from evil. And so they keep accelerating the problem. We are, we are morally and sexually confused. So let's go and get more therapy from those that have morally and sexually confused us. That will sort it out. I, I actually hear people advocating that what we need to help with the moral and sexual confusion in our world, we need looser 
uh, restrictions on pornography. That will help. That will help. You know, get it into the elementary school so so that we can, we can help early on. It's a death spot. How dark. The problem is our sight. Our problem is the light that we think we have is darkness. Mm. The question is, what light will you use? Will you use the light of God or the light of self? How will you make judgments? How will you make decisions? Psalm 119 tells us the word of God is a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my path. But other places in the Bible tell us about those who did what was right in their own eyes. Famously, at the end of the book of Judges, if you want to get a preview of the trajectory of our culture, you might have a joyful read of the book of Judges. That is, That book is literally written as a death spiral. It, it is a circular movement that gets darker with each cycle, and at the end it is madness when there was no king in Israel and every man did what was right in his own eyes. We need light from God. That's the question. Whose light? Whose sight? We use. Thirdly, two masters comes to a crescendo here in verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Or if you have a KJV or you have a KJV, King James Version, in your head, you cannot serve God and mammon. It's simply a transliteration of the Greek word here. Some think that uh, Mammon or Mammona was a Syrian deity, the god of riches or god of wealth. Maybe there was such a deity. This is simply the word wealth personified. Personified. But what is it? What is Mammon or what is wealth? When, when, do, you, when do you have wealth? I'm wealthier now than I was before. Uh, is that wealth? What, what is the number? When do you get to the, when, when do you cross that line? Well, of course, whatever it is, whatever number you think of, just move to a different place and you either are still wealthy or you're more wealthy or now you're not wealthy at all. You know, I've been, 20 years ago, I visited Uganda. I felt like the richest man on planet Earth. I visited a couple literally in their windowless grass hut and they let me use the stool which was terribly awkward they let me have the stool the one piece of furniture to sit on we sat outside I felt super wealthy shamefully wealthy take me to San Francisco and I'm poor what is Wealth, it's not a number, it's not an amount, it's not a certain number of digits. What, what is it? Why do we want it? Whether we can define it or not, why would we watch TV programs about people who have it or read magazine articles about them? Oh, look, look at their wealth. Why, I can see all their shiny wealth things. Why do we, why do, we do that? Why do we have books about how you can get wealthy? And schemes and programs, I see the ads all the time. I'm always amazed by the pitch that says, I figured out how to get wealthy. Come pay me, and I'll tell you. And I'm like, if you figured it out, huh, why do you need me to pay you? Why, why, mm, yeah, I think I just figured it out too. <laughs> why do we dream about it? Why do we want wealth? Wealth is secure. Wealth is safe. It's safety, certainly safety against, say, starvation. It's probably safety against crime. And it might be safety against illness. Maybe, maybe not. It'll certainly help. It won't hurt. 
even if you're dying, you'll at least be more comfortable. It's safety, security, it's freedom. Oh, what if I had wealth, I, I can do what I want to do. Go where I want to go, buy what I want to buy, have what I want to have. If I had wealth, if I have that freedom. Wealth is autonomy. If you have wealth, then you tell people what to do. And if you don't have wealth, then people tell you what to do. And so you'd say, well, I think I'd rather have wealth. And then I can tell people what to do. I can tell them to cut my grass, and wash my car, and bring me sushi. That's what I can tell them to do. Bring it to me at my house. I'll be inside while you're outside cutting my grass. Why, that's why we want wealth, autonomy, freedom, security. You see what wealth is? It's an amplifier. It's a multiplier. Of what? Me. It's an amplifier of me. I can live my life on my terms. I can order events according to my idea. I can make my life revolve around me. At least I can make it more so. I may not, I may not have quite enough, even if I'm wealthy, to make everything revolve around me, but I can make a bunch of it. It's an amplifier of me. I can make me the center. When Jesus says, you cannot serve God and mammon, he's not simply, you, he's not simply saying, you can't serve the true God and a false God, a deity of wealth. He's not just saying, you can't serve God and wealth, or God and success, the idol of success, you, he's not just saying you can't serve God in this and God in that or God or another. Fundamentally, it's a choice between God and myself. God and myself. That's what wealth is about. It's not about pieces of paper, rectangular pieces of paper with uh, uh, funny engravings on them. Who cares? It's about me. There are two choices. Well, there the choice of two things. There are two hopes. Earthly treasure and heavenly treasure. Those are the two hopes. Grab it all and bring it to me. Or put it, my hopes, in heaven. There are two ways of making my way in the world. By the light of God's word or the light of my own judgment. My, my own appetites, my own desires, I can, I can be guided by the one or I can be guide, guided by the others because there are two masters in the world, ultimately. There is the master who is the Lord above and there is myself. It is either my will or thy will which will be done. That's the choice that is before us. I may call it wealth. I may call it riches, I may call it success, I may call it fame, I may call it this, I may call it that, but at the end of the day, all of these things come down to me or thee. Mammon is money, it is wealth, it is worldly success, but underneath it is a choice between God and self. Jesus says you cannot serve two masters. He did not say we will not try. Oh, will we try. Christian, we try. All the time we try to serve two masters. He didn't say we won't try. He said you can't. One of them is going to dethrone the other. You're going to love one and you're going to hate the other. There is a, a righteous hating of self, sinful self. If you're not a Christian and you're trying to serve two masters, the day will come when you simply just drop Jesus. I mean, he's getting in the way. Whether you say it or not, you will. I've met many people who have dropped Jesus a long time ago tell you they're Christians. They don't go to church, they don't read the Bible, they don't pray, they don't do anything. Oh, but I'm a Christian. I walked an aisle when I was eight. I try to be a good person. Oh, no, they dropped Jesus a long time ago. If you are a Christian, if you're born again in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll still try. 
You'll struggle with trying. That's called the warfare between the flesh and the spirit. Eventually, Jesus will win out, Christian. And you'll be glad when he does. But how will you get there? Will you get there like Peter after denying him three times? In fear and then coming to Jesus shamefaced, tear streaked. Will you come home like the prodigal after squandering so much, not just stuff, but of himself? And then realizing where he needed to be all along? You may. In some sense, every one of us does. Every one of us does up to denies the Lord as Jesus did. Every one of us goes off in far country to one degree or another. Just don't you want to make that a shorter route? A shorter visit to the far country. Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Everything else is moth food. It's just moth food. What are you going to do with your treasure? I'm going to put it in a hole in the ground. You know what that's called? A grave. Why put your heart in the grave? Rather, set your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ who came out of the grave and conquered it. Let your heart be bound up with him in heaven forever. Amen? As we pray. Great and mighty God, we do worship you this day. We praise you. And Father, I know you know all too well. The masters I have sought to serve, the distraction of soul. We have to eat, we have to drink, we have to live. We have to make wise decisions as stewards of the things that you have put into our hands. And it is not wrong to be a good steward. But Father, I pray that you would forgive us and guide us and strengthen us, that we would not become the slaves of that which we ought to steal. Let us not put our treasures, not where they may be destroyed, but where they will be destroyed. And if they're not destroyed, they'll be taken from us. For as Job well observed, naked we came into the world, and naked we will go out, no matter how fine a suit or how rich a box they put me in. I go out with nothing of this life. I pray, Father, that you would be teaching us, training us, leading us, guiding us, making us store away the treasures in heaven. While it may cost us now in this life, I pray that we would know, that we would know for sure that when we are with you face to face, we will regret not a thing sacrificed below and not a thing treasured and stored away in heaven. We will only regret, if we have any regrets in glory, that we had not suffered more and put away more with you. Give us those riches, we ask in Jesus' name.